So before I begin, it is important to uh, first do an introduction. My name is Willie Dongo Kingori. I am the son of Bishop Kingori, who is actually at main service. And um, I'm also the son of Pastor Lucy Kingori. You have to always add your mother's name, because if you just say you're, you're the son and you don't mention the mother, you're in trouble, okay? Um, so I'm also the pa son of Pastor Lucy Kingori. I am so fortunate, so fortunate, to be the husband of Warimo Dorcas Kingori. Um, she's my beautiful wife. I'm fortunate to have her. Don't, don't say it the other way. I'm fortunate to have her. Um, and also, I, I, as of March 3rd, 2022, I became a father. As of March 3rd, 2022, I became a father to Theo Jackson Kingori. Theo Jackson Kingori, that's my son's name. And um, I just, I, I love my family so much. I always talk about them wherever I'm at because I'm fortunate to be a son. I'm fortunate to be a husband. I'm fortunate to be a father. Um, and I also want to pay respects to Deliverance Church for this opportunity uh, to come to you and preach the word. If there's one thing I'm passionate about, it's uh, the word of God. And if there's one thing that I like to preach, um, it is the word of God. So um, thank you to Deliverance Church, to Bishop Kimani. Um, can we give a round of applause to Bishop Kimani? Yes. If you don't know, um, Bishop Kimani actually visited our home, and he has prayed for me and my wife several, several times. So your bishop is near and dear to my heart, near and dear. Um, so I think, that, I think of this as a privilege to be here, right? It's not a right. It's a privilege for me to be here. Um, and also, I want to give honor and respect to all the stewards of this ministry, all the stewards, all the pastors, all the servants, everybody who's been here, who has served and done, even from the cameraman to the drummer, to the person who was just singing, to um, the pastors. Every, can we give a round of applause to the servants of the house, please? Because one thing I've learned about stewardship is that stewardship is not an option, it's an expectation, okay? Stewardship is not an option, it's an expectation. Okay, so um, as we go into the word of God, I want to, I'm very simple with my word. I like to just say everything plainly. That way, if you're taking notes, we can be in and out. Is that okay? Okay, I need some feedback. Is that okay? Okay, okay. Now I can stretch out. Now I can stretch out. So the name of this sermon is Cover Me, I'm Recovering. Cover Me, actually, the name of the sermon is Cover Me, I'm Reloading cover me, I'm reloading. And one of the reasons I think um, God put this uh, word on my heart is because in a time of distress, in a time of turmoil, in a time in which you're being attacked, it is good to know that someone is covering you as you're reloading. Now, I have to ask, has anybody played any PS5 games, any Call of Duty games, it's okay to confess. Has anybody played those kind of games? Okay, okay, so you know the term, cover me, I'm reloading. You know what the term means. And for those who don't, I'll give you a synopsis. In, in the game of Call of Duty or Modern Warfare, man, I'm telling my age, okay. So in those kinds of games, what happens is, as a soldier, when you have run out of ammunition, you need to, if you can't see me, it's because the illustration. You need to crouch down and you need to reload your weapon. You need to get down. You need to be in a position of defense and reload your weapon. And you need to communicate to your brothers or sisters, cover me. I need you to cover me. And what cover me means, just to put it plainly, is... I'm not dead, I'm not down, but I have run out of ammunition, and we have an enemy. So I'm not dead, I'm not down, but I've run out of ammunition, and we have an enemy, and he is coming. So if you do not cover me, I may die. If you do not cover me, I may die. It's not to say that the journey will stop. It's not to say that the, the army of the Lord will not advance. It's not to say, because how many know that we operate out of victory? 
We don't, we don't fight a war that is lost. We operate out of victory. So when, it, when the soldier is saying, cover me, he's saying, if you do not cover me, I may die. So cover me. Now, as I was, as I was hearing the worship team, and I just put, it just put it so much on my heart that I feel like this is a good word for someone who needs to know that you are covered by the Lord. That you need to know that in your, in your current status, in your current situation, whether you are looking for an opportunity, whether you are being oppressed by someone or a situation, you need to know that God is covering you. And you also need to know that your brothers and sisters are covering you. Someone say, cover me. Cover me. Amen. So as we go to scripture, one of the, re- one of the things I like to go to, but one of the things I like to do, of course, is go to scripture and see what the Lord has to say. So as we go to Job chapter 18, Job chapter 18, um, I'm going to be referencing the entire chapter, specifically verse 21. Job chapter 18, verses 21. Now to paint the picture, because scripture always needs context, right? Someone say context. What ha- in the book of Job, we know Job to be a man of God. We know that in the beginning it is described that Job um, is a man who is blameless and is a man who, does not, who did not sin before God. And one of the things that we see in Job chapter 18 verses 21 is Job has lost everything. Job has lost everything. Job has lost his fortune. Job has lost his family. Job has lost everything. And one of the things that we see in the previous chapter, because this is a response to what Job had just said before, right? This is one of his close friends, Bildad. Someone say Bildad. So this is what Bildad was saying in response to what Job was saying in the previous chapter. Job was, comp- Job was confessing that he is in turmoil, that he is conflicted because the Lord God is sovereign. He is king. He is a good God, but he has lost everything. Now, as as a friend, one of the things, uh, as people who are always looking for friends in the body of Christ, one of the things that I came to talk to you today is just how to sift out and find a good friend, how to find a good person who can cover you. Right now, as we're looking at Job chapter 18, verses 21, we see that the response of Bildad is actually showing his character, which brings me to my first point. Um, Allow your friends to show you who they are and whose they are. So if you're writing down points, allow your friends to show you who they are and whose they are. In verse 21, we see that Bildad, the entire chapter, he takes the time to be critical of Job in his affliction. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever, whenever I'm in a situation, whenever I'm in a turmoil, it is important that my friends listen to me, right? It's, my important, it's important that my friends don't make the situation worse than it already is. Have you ever met a friend who's, who's just, whenever you're telling them, hey, man, I just lost my job, Man, I just lost my girlfriend. Man, I just lost my shoes. And then they just make the situation like, ah, those shoes weren't even pretty fly to begin with, you know. And and then your girl wasn't even, you know, she's kind of talking to a boy at the other day, you know what I'm saying? Like, they just make the situation worse. Can you believe? That is not the kind of person you need in your life. You need the kind of person who says, oh, you lost your shoes? Hey, buddy, have mine. Oh, you lost your girl? Man, to be honest. (laughs) God got another one for you. God got a wife coming. I'm telling you. God got somebody on the way. You need someone to encourage you. Because when when you are in it, you don't need someone digging you a bigger grave. Can I get an amen to that? So as we see, one of the illustrations that we see in the book of Job is we have three friends, and a friend is an opportunity. A friend is an opportunity. We have three friends, therefore we have three opportunities for Job 
to, to trust in his friends, and he does, but he has those, those three friends show their character. They show who they are. They show what they have to say when Job is in affliction, when he has lost his family, when he has lost his finances. They show who they are. Now, for the, for the sake of one of the things I like to do, and, and if you will, I, my purpose is to convict, right? My purpose is that you take account of your friendship list and you say, whenever I came to so-and-so, were they there for me? Did they listen to me? Did they take into account my situation? Did they, did they remind me of the goodness of the Lord? Did they remind me to go back to scripture? Did they remind me to go back to my prayer closet? Did they cover me? Because as many as you believe, and I'll talk to the fellas. Fellas, say what's up. Okay, okay. What's that? What's that? What's that? Fellas, can you say what's up? Okay. I heard what's up. Okay, so that's like 12th grade. Okay. Fellas, can you say what's up? Okay, I appreciate y'all. Fellas, it is not toxic for you to seek out help from a friend. It is hard for us sometimes to go to our brothers and say, hey, bro, I'm struggling. But you got to know it is okay to go to a friend and say, I need you to cover me. I need you to have my back. A military terminology is I need you to have my six. Twelve, one, two, three, four, five, six. Right. I need you to have my six because when you know that your brother is covering you, you move with purpose. You move with strength. You move with faith. And you move on the battlefield differently. Now, one of the things I always want to remind you is be careful who you complain to. Be careful who you complain to. Because in the book of Job, we see that his complaints landed on ears that were not willing to cover him. So when, you're, when you go to your brothers, it is important that you as the first point said, allow your friends to show you who they are and whose they are. Because, and this is a sub point, your character development is determined by your character selection. Oof. Your character development is determined by your character selection. One of the people that I just thought about is David and Jonathan. David and Jonathan. You have to understand, Jonathan was the son of Saul. Jonathan was entitled to the throne. Jonathan had everything lined up for him. But when it came time to be loyal to one man, when it came time to be loyal to one human being, he said, I will be loyal to David. I will cover David. Yes, my, my father is actually throwing spears at David, trying to actively kill him multiple times. But guess whose back I will cover David. And sometimes we need to know that we have a friend who's going to cover our back like that. Can you believe that? An unknown person covering your back despite his father. That's why when the word of God talks about who is my mother, who is my brother, it is those who do the will of the Lord. So I'm encouraged to tell you that if you don't have a friend now who's going to cover you, you will. If you, don't have, if you haven't found someone who's going to cover your six, you will. Because the, Lord that God, because the Lord God that we serve has given us community that we can rely on. Everybody say amen. amen. Now as we go to Mark chapter 2 verses 1 through 12. Mark chapter 2 verses 1 through 12. I love this scripture. I love this scripture because it talks about the, the faith of the four who, who brought down their friend through the roof. So Mark chapter, one verses, Mark chapter 2 verses 1 reads, do you have the ESV? I'll be reading from the ESV. Mark chapter 2 verses 1 through 12. When I took off my shirt, I didn't put it back on, so... Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, and it reads, When he returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. 
and many had gathered together so that, they were, that, that there was no room even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came, bringing him a paralytic carried by four men. Bringing him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let him down, and they let down the bed which the paralytic lay, and Jesus saw their faith, and he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Son, your sins are forgiven. One of the reasons I believe this verse is for us and for the present day is because some of us are paralyzed in our situation. Some of you don't know that you need help. Some of you are too down to get help. Some of you need people who are going to go to extreme lengths in order to make you see God, in order to put you at the feet of Jesus. Now, I'll be honest, when I first read this verse, I don't think I knew uh, how to react to four people if they tried to bring me at the feet of Jesus. Sometimes it can feel like the situation around you is overwhelming and people are just taking you for a ride, but it's good to know that the place that you're going to is at the feet of Jesus. I can only imagine the paralytic who was thinking, where are my friends taking me? Where are they trying to put me at? Well, who are they taking me to? But thank God it was at the feet of Jesus and that he had friends who were covering him. And the second point that I want to say is, show me your friends and I'll show you who you want to be. Show me your friends and I'll show you who you want to be. There's a story about a young man who was going to school, and it was a boarding school. And he was, for the most part, he was a good young gentleman. He was following the rules. He was trying to make good grades. In terms of ranking, he was, he was three. He wasn't first or second. He was number three. But he was okay, and, and when his parents looked at him, they were proud, right? Now, he was also a part of a group, and the group was doing considerably well. They were going to church, but then there came a newcomer into the group. There came a young man who was from another country who decided to, that he was going to that school, and then this young man was a troublemaker. This young man defied authority. And because he defied authority, one of the things that this group found was, he was they found themselves gravitating around him. And the analogy that this young man had heard from his parents is, a bad mango ruins the bunch. In America, we say a bad apple ruins the bunch. So as the story goes, this bad apple came into the group and he was defying the authority. He was cheating in class. He was stealing things. He actually stole some things from the teacher. He was very bold. And one of the things that they did one time is that, yeah, I'm going to say it. So one of the things that he did was that on a weekend, this is a true story, by the way, on a weekend, he had actually called some call girls. Everybody know what a call girl is? He had called some call girls over for the weekend. And he's like, hey, you know, bros, we're going to have a good time. You know what I'm saying? You know, we're going to have some call girls. I can't tell you why that's a bad situation. If you don't know what a call girl is, it's a bad situation. It's a bad situation. So they had called some call girls over, and it, it got back to the principal that, hey, these young men, because of this, this newcomer, had called some call girls. He was ruining the bunch. Now, one of the people who was another, he was the youngest in the group, he had the habit of always taking the blame for what was happening with the group. Maybe because he was the youngest, but he always took the blame for what was happening in the group. Now, after the, the call girl situation, what happened was they were disciplined and they were told not to do that again. But of course, because the young man, because the man who was new was the worst, he kept on getting them in trouble. And one time they went to the, the, one time they went to the beach and actually they decided that they were going to skip school, go to the beach and buy 
Live call girls, what you call prostitutes. Now, the story goes that as they engaged in ungodly behavior, they decided that they were going to go swim after. Now, no one knew, but the youngest boy did not know how to swim. But he wanted so desperately to be a part of this group. He wanted so desperately to be a part of this group of young men that four of them had swam out, but only three came back. So it is so important that the people that you surround yourselves with are people who are taking you towards God, are people who are actively bringing you towards the feet of Christ. Because if you don't, the detriment to your growth can be a bad friend. So my hope is that we are always sifting through the friends that we have. We're always looking through the friends that we have. And we say, hey, are you for me or are you against me? Are, are, are you only a friend because of proximity, because we go to the same university, or will you be my friend after this? It's important to sift out your friends sometimes. You need to know who's a seasonal friend and who's a permanent friend, who's a friend for this time and who's a friend for all time. Because it's the friends who are there for all time who are going to walk with you through your struggle, who are going to walk with you when you are even questioning your faith. Your friends, a good friend in Christ, is always going to bring you back to the feet of Christ. Amen? And the last point I have, and we could bring up John chapter 15, verses 15. John chapter 15, verses 15. And one of the beautiful things I love about the story of David and Jonathan is Jonathan is a foreshadowing character of Jesus. He is a foreshadowing character of Jesus. In the same, and the reason I believe that Jonathan and David's heart was knitted together, that Jonathan loved David as if he was his own, is because if you read through scripture and you read the response that Jonathan had to the Philistines, that Jonathan had to the Philistines, it says that who are these uncircumcised people against the Lord? I'm paraphrasing. And the same response that Jonathan had is the same response that David had at the face of Goliath. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine standing before the army of the Lord? And if you look back through scripture, one of the key things that you see is Jonathan and David said the army of the Lord. They did not say the army of Saul. They did not say the army of Saul. They said the army of the Lord. So you could see that Jonathan and David were operating out of authority, out of the highest authority in the land, knowing that they were the lords before they were anybody's king. I like to pause right there because sometimes in our attempt to follow authority, we lose sight of who God is. Sometimes when we are trying to be in line with authority, we forget that our ultimate authority is the word of God and God himself. So as we see that David and John were knitted together, they were so close. One of the things that we see in John chapter 15, verses 15 is if you copy and paste this scripture, it can be taken and used as the response that Jonathan had towards David. It says, no longer do I call you servants, for I, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friend. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. One of the reasons I said that Jonathan is a foreshadowing character of David is because uh, one of the reasons I say Jonathan is a foreshadowing character of Jesus is because if you feel like you don't have a friend, Jesus is your ultimate friend. Jesus is your ultimate comfort. Jesus is the one that you can go to. Jesus is the one that will cover your six because he knows that you have an enemy. 
He knows that you are in turmoil. He knows that you are suffering and affliction, and he has got your back as you are reloading. And I love the term, I'm reloading, because it, it reminds you that you are fighting offensively. I don't know if some of you feel like you are defeated and you feel like the circumstances around you have got you defensive, but I'm here to remind you that you are to fight offensively. It says that the word of God is a sword. Does it say a shield? It says a sword. It's for you to fight offensively because the enemy knows that one of the best things to do is to get you to be docile and to get you to sit down and not stand up for the word of God and not stand up and be bold and not attack where the enemy is attacking. Because if I'm to confess, when you go to America, when you visit America, I know you've seen some of the things that America is struggling with. I know you see some of the identity that America is struggling with. And it's always important as Christians, both here and there, that we fight offensively, that we fight a battle because when the way that you change your mindset from being defensive to offensive is to know that the battle is won. That you have victory in Christ Jesus. So I'm encouraged to remind you that the battle that you face has already been won, but it does not absolve you from standing up and fighting. It does not absolve you from standing up and fighting. And trust me, I know, I know how it is. Sometimes I sat in the back. Sometimes I was dozing off and head bobbing in the past, just sleeping. And just. But I'm telling you, sometimes the word of God and the presentation of the word of God and the people who are, who are pouring into you, those are the words that you remember when you are actually going through a struggle. Those are the words that you remember when you are in affliction. The word of God and the people who poured into you and took the time that they did to pour into you. So I'm encouraged that everybody has an opportunity to either be a Jonathan or to have a Jonathan. Everyone has the opportunity to be covered or to cover someone. Someone turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going to cover you. Someone turn to the other neighbor and say, I'm going to cover you. I turn to the other neighbor and say, who's going to cover me? You going to cover me? You going to cover me? And I'll end with this illustration because when we see the word of God, when we, uh, we approach the word of God, it is important that we respond, right? And when I mean respond, I don't mean, okay, that was a good scripture. Okay, that was a good word. No, no, no. What I mean is obedience. What I mean is obedience. Your life in God requires obedience. Now, for some of you, I, I, I just saw, I'm not going to say who I saw. I just saw a head. Man, this man said obedience. I don't want to do this. Obedience is a life-saving process. Obedience to God is a life-saving process. It will save you from situations. It will save you. Catch this. It will save you from yourself. Some of us know, and if we're being honest, some of us can tell that our decisions have not put us in the best situation sometimes. But it is the obedience that we have when we find, that we find in scripture that has vindicated us, that has delivered us, that has sustained us. So when we see the word of God and we read through these scriptures, it's important that we approach it and say, okay, this is what the Lord says. This is what I think. I choose to obey the word of God. I, and it's important to, that you always, it's okay to say, you know what? This is where I'm at. This is what the Lord God says. I, I will trust in the Lord. Because as you see with the story of Job, he made his complaints known to the Lord. He said, Lord, I'm struggling. Lord, this affliction that you have, Lord, I've lost my family. I've lost my wealth. I've lost all these things. But you know that he took all of his complaints to God, the best place you can take them. 
So as we're approaching the word of God, please remember we approach it with obedience. Someone say obedience. obedience. Okay, it wasn't, it wasn't a poisonous word. Say obedience. obedience. Amen, amen. And I'll end with this illustration. One time there was a lawyer who was traveling to, from Kenya to the United States, right? And he was traveling Qatar. You know, Qatar was really nice, right? And if you know Qatar, it's nice. He was traveling Qatar, he had his tickets, he was ready, and he was traveling with his coworker, right? And him and his coworker were ready for the flight. They, attend, they got to the gate on time, they checked in on time, you know, you gotta take off your shoes, take off your shirt, you know, if you're traveling with some musas, they, they gotta inspect everything. They did everything that they needed to do, they were on time. But then, as they were sitting in their terminal, sitting in their gate, they saw on the board, flight delayed. Next flight, four hours. I don't have patience, I'm sorry. That's a long time. Is four hours a long time to you? So the next flight that Qatar had was for four hours. But then there was a man who was sitting right next to them and he was saying, you know what? Guys, if you guys are looking for a flight, I happen to be a pilot. I can fly private jets and I'm actually about to go to my private jet and fly to America, would you guys like to have a seat on my plane? I don't know about you, but that sounds like a good deal. A man just decided like, hey, I can fly planes. I want to take you and your coworker at no cost with me to America. Would you like to come? Now, if it was me, I'd, okay, you ain't got to tell me twice, oh, man, let's go. But, but I don't know if it was because they were a lawyer or they were just wise. They started to ask questions like, okay, um, are you FAA regulated? Do you, can I see your pilot license? Are you, are you sure you're a pilot? Are, they were skeptical because it seemed too good to be true, right? But then they decided, you know what? We're gonna trust this man. We're gonna go on this flight. And we're gonna make it to America, our destination. So they go, they drive with the man, they take, they get on boat, they get, it, they get on the car, they get to the destination, they get to the tarmac, and they see that the, the person that they just met is inspecting the plane, so he looks legit, you know, he looks like an actual pilot, he's looking around the plane, making sure, okay, got three wheels, doesn't need four, okay. Got two, okay, got two wings, okay. It's a pointy tip at the beginning, okay, we're good, we're good. It's got a wheel, so we know what we're doing, okay, okay. So he's doing everything that looks like a pilot, right? Right? So then they get into the plane, and the lawyer who said yes to the proposal is sitting at the right front side. And the pilot is sitting at the left front side. And the coworker is sitting right behind them, right? So as they're preparing for the plane, they get into the plane, it's going down the tarmac, it lifts off, and they're doing well, right? He's like, okay, this guy actually knows how to fly a plane. He actually knows how to fly a plane. But then the pilot leans over and he says to the man, hey bro, I forgot to tell you. Um, and you know it's just bad when somebody tells you that. <laughs> it's like, hey bro, I forgot to tell you something. Uh, I can't fly in clouds. Um, I actually pass out when I see clouds. So just a heads up, just in case you, just in case we see any clouds, I'm gonna pass out, you gotta figure this out, okay? Mind you, the forecast said cloudy all day. In Kenya, in US where they were landing, it was cloudy all day. So this lawyer is looking next to him like, I don't know whether to punch you and knock you out, or I, I, don't, I don't know if I just, are there parachutes? Do we need to talk? And before you know it, this man had taken off and they were headed towards clouds and he just, And his lawyer's looking at him, he's like, what are you doing? Wake up, we are in the air, please. Like, and every time he's shaking the, the pilot, com just completely out, right? So of course, they remove him from the pilot's seat 
and he, the lawyer gets into the pilot seat and he's calling for help. Mayday, mayday, mayday. We need help. Mayday, mayday. I do not know what I'm doing. Is this the right, is this the right frequency? Mayday, mayday. So eventually, after they go through all the different frequencies that they can, they finally get to someone who's another commercial flight flying in their vicinity. And the commercial flight's asking him, are you, are you a pilot? He's like, no, I'm not a pilot. I'm a lawyer. Please, we need help. Mayday, mayday. <sighs> this is a bad situation. Now, as the man is trying to communicate the situation, the pilot that's flying the commercial flight says, hey, I'm going to fly around you because if I get outside of your vicinity, you're going to be outside of frequency for me to help you. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to fly around you. That way, I'm not outside of your frequency when you need help. Okay? As the man, and as the man is listening, he's like, okay, but I need help. I need to know where to land. I need to know how to navigate through the clouds. I need to know where to go next. So the pilot says, I'm going to call dispatch. Yes, Lord. I'm going to call dispatch because although I can fly around you and make sure that you're going in the right direction, you need to talk to dispatch. You need to talk to get you need to talk to a higher authority. You need to talk to someone who can not only tell you how to fly, but how to land. You need to talk to someone who is going to make sure you don't fly into something or someone else you don't need to. You need to talk to dispatch, right? So as he's telling him and saying, I'm going to get dispatch on the air for you, I just need you to be still. I just need you to be patient. Because guess what? I got you. I got you. So as the man is waiting and he's being patient on the flight, not knowing what to do, what to press, where to look, and he's seeing a cloud, of, a stormy cloud right in front of him. Uh, the next voice that he hears is dispatch. And you know, dispatch, sometimes they got that country action. Niner, Niner, we just hear, we, we heard that you, uh, we, you need some help. Can we, uh, can we know a little bit about the situation? We're just trying to understand what is, uh, what is going on. I just had my cup of coffee, but let's go. Come on. So as he gets on, as dispatch gets on, and he's trying to understand the situation, he makes it very clear to the man. Okay, son, I'm dispatch. I'm here to help you. I'm here to cover you. But there's one thing I need you to do. There's one thing I need you to do because I've been in this situation before. Many people have been in your situation before in which they were lost, not qualified to fly the plane. So I need you to do one thing. I need you to obey my voice. I need you to listen to my voice. I know what you're about to see. I can see what you're looking at. I can see what's in front of you. I can see the stormy clouds. I can see the situation, but I need you to obey my voice. I need you to, no matter, I need you to trust me over your instincts. I need you to obey my voice. So as this flight, as this lawyer, now pilot, is trying to navigate, he decides, okay, I'm going to listen to this man. Right now, we're, we're a good distance from the clouds, but I'm going to listen to the man. So as, as he's entering the clouds, he's listening to the man, and as there's turbulence, he's like, okay, are you still there? He's like, yes, I can hear everything you're going through. Obey my voice. Fly straight. Obey my voice, fly straight. And as it's been a couple hours and he's flying straight and he's still turbulence, and now the man, the, the dispatcher comes back on the line. He says, Hey, we have a bit of a situation. We have a bit of a situation. The current direction that you're flying to, if you stay on that direction, you are going to fly into a mountain. 
if you stay the current path that you are on, you are going to fly into a mountain. And you will, n- you will not have a 10% chance of dying. You will not have a 1% chance of dying. You will have a 100% chance of death. So guess what I need you to do? Listen to my voice. I need you to turn to the left. Then I need you to wait. Then I need you to turn to the right. Then I need you to wait. I need you to listen to me because it's not one mountain that you're going to face. It's several. It's not one mountain in front of you. It's several. So if you decide to listen to my voice one time and then neglect it the rest, you will die. And is that the same thing that God is telling us today? You need to listen and obey my voice. Because if you decide to start off by listening to the word of God, if you start off by going in prayer, if you start off by listening to the the servants who are before you, interceding on your behalf, if you start off that way, but then you neglect the word of God, you neglect prayer, you neglect going before him, you neglect the Holy Spirit, you will surely die. So as the man is listening to dispatch, he says, okay, I will listen to you. I will close my eyes. I will follow your voice. So the dispatch navigates him through the mountains. And you think the story would end there, right? It's a long one. So now the dispatch is, he says, okay, son, we have one more thing that we need to do. It's time for you to land. It's time for you to land. Now, I understand that where you're landing is the great state of Texas, but where you're landing, it's completely foggy. You don't see the road. You cannot see the tarmac. The only thing that you can see is the lights that are forming across. And he says very clear to me, he says very clear to the man, I need you to fly to the cross. I need you to fly to the cross. If there's anything that you see, you need to see the cross. If there's any direction that you go to, go to the cross. And I believe that's the story today. I believe that's the story today. Because if we're looking at situations that we've been in or we're currently in, we need to fly to the cross. It's not enough to just be obedient. You need to go to the feet of Jesus. You need to have this connected, intentional, and purposeful relationship with Jesus himself. You need to go to the cross. So as dispatch is preparing the man, and he's saying, hey, as you're heading towards the cross, I'm going to tell you when to lift up, so then the back wheels will hit first, and you'll land. So as he's closing his eyes and hearing dispatch, he, he, he lands safely. And he successfully landed and saved his friends. Can we give him a round of applause, whoever this person is? Now, as the man has just been overwhelmed by what just happened, and ironically, guess who decides to wake up as soon as they land? Get, man. If you thought he was a main character, he's like character C, because he decides to wait. And, and his first question, so how's the flight, gentlemen? Was it good? You enjoy yourselves? So as, and you know, whenever a situation like that happens, the ambulance come out, they want to make sure that the pilots are safe, they want to make sure that the passengers are safe, and eventually they take them to a hotel so they can stay, because we can agree that's a pretty great ordeal. Right? That's a pretty great ordeal. So as the man is finally with his co-worker, the other lawyer, and I'm just surprised that this lawyer didn't say anything the entire story. He must have just... <laughs> but as they're finally in their hotel, about to rest, literally about to go to sleep, the next thing they hear is... And they're wondering... Who, who, first of all, who's coming to my door at 4 a.m.? We just got through a plane, like I avoided a plane crash. 
Like, why is someone knocking at our door at 4 a.m.? So as they go to open the door, out of sheer curiosity, they open the door and they see a man they don't recognize at first. They're like, who are you? That's literally what the man said. Who are you? Knocking at our door at 4 a.m. And the man says, it's nice to meet you. And by the sheer voice of the man, the lawyer knew exactly who it was. It was dispatch. It was the man talking to him. It was the man who said, I need you to obey me. I need you to follow my directions. I need you to fly to the cross. And the only way that the lawyer recognized him was by his voice. The same way scripture says that we will recognize our Lord and Savior, that the sheep respond to the master's voice. So as the man is just dumbfounded, this is the dispatcher that was here who literally saved my life. This dispatcher is almost in tears. The dispatcher is almost in tears, but it's not tears of sadness. It's tears of joy. It's tears because the dispatcher says, you got to understand, son. Many people have died where you lived. Many people have crashed where you survived. Many people hit the mountains where you decided to obey. And it is because you obeyed my voice that you are here now. And with open arms, he embraces them in. And if you know anything about a country accent, it doesn't matter how, how old you are, it's like, I love you, son. I just love you. They always call each other son. But it's fitting, right? I love you, son. I love you, daughter. Thank you for obeying the word of God. Thank you for listening to God. Thank you for obeying the Holy Spirit. So I'm encouraged with that story to remind you that you, I don't know your situation, seems like every pastor says that I don't know your situation, but I don't. I really don't. I really don't. I know my situation, but I'm encouraged to remind you of what a life looks like that obeys the voice of God. You have to understand God stands outside of time, outside of eternity, and he knows what you're going to face next. He knows the mountains in front of you. He knows what will happen if you don't fly straight towards the cross. And everything that he's telling you, everything that he's ever said to you, is for your good. You have a good God. You have a God who intercedes for you. You have a God who delights in your joy. So of all the voices that you're listening to, of all the voices that are in your ear, whether you got AirPods, Beats by Dre, whether you got some bootleg, whatever voices are in your ear today, I encourage you, listen to the voice of God. Listen to him. Go to your prayer closet and seek him. It is the best voice you will hear, and it is the only voice that will save your life. A part of the sermon today was to encourage you to keep good company and find good friends that are going to cover your back. It's okay to say that not everybody's perfect, right? We, we live, you guys, are, I can be real with you guys, not everybody's perfect, which means not everybody can cover your back at all times. But God? If you apply just that one phrase to every situation in your life, but God. 
I just lost my job. I just lost this family member that is so close to me. But God, I don't know where I'm going to be tomorrow. I didn't have enough for the fair here. I don't have enough for the fair back. I don't have enough for a family member who needs food and sustenance. But God, if you take away anything from this situation, anything from this conversation, this is a but God moment. So as I close, one of the things I just want you to think about is I want everybody to close their eyes for a second. And I just want you to think about the worst thing that you are facing, the most overwhelming thing that you can think of, the thing that you, if someone doesn't cover you right now, you might die. And it doesn't have to be physical. It can be mental. It can be your mental health. It can be your spiritual health. It can be your physical health. And you need to know that someone is covering you. You need to know that, the, that someone has got your back. As you're thinking about that situation, all I want you to say right now is, but God. All I want you to think about now is, but God. Because a good thing to remember grammatically is when you say the word but, everything before it really doesn't matter. Everything the, before the word but takes secondary priority to everything after. So when you say, but God, you are saying, Lord, my situation, but you reign. Lord, my circumstance, but you got me. Lord, I need to reload. I know you're covering me. But God.